feel free to come to one of our meetings at any time on their public meetings, usually on the first Wednesday of every month, um, if you want to hear what we're doing in the city to become more sustainable. Um, with that being said, uh, we do have a sustainability plan that was adopted um, by our city commission and part of that plan is um, holding education events for our residents and also for all of Brevard County. So we're excited to also welcome some additional Brevard County residents um, in addition to our Cocoa Beach residents today. Um, so if you have missed some of our previous education events this year, stay tuned because we're hoping to bring you more. Um, and we're also looking for suggestions on topics, things you guys want to hear about, what you can do at home to become more sustainable or environment, environmentally friendly, um, or really just helping the lagoon in any way you can um, so we can all work together in that collective effort. Um, so with that, I want to welcome uh, Nicole from the Marine Resources Council today to talk about uh, rain barrels and how we can implement those within our homes um, and how it's going to help us with um, stormwater management. Um, so Nicole, take it away. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey. That was a fantastic uh, introduction. Um, so as you know, my name is Nicole Broquet and I'm the Environmental Education Coordinator at the Marine Resources Council and I'm here to teach you about our rain barrels and possibly help you install yours. Um, just a little bit of quick background about who the Marine Resources Council is, um, if you're unfamiliar with us. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that is based down in Palm Bay and we work out of that blue house. Um, and we are uh, dedicated to protecting and restoring the Indian River Lagoon through science, restoration, and education. So we have a lot of really great science programs um, that really focus on different kinds of water quality uh, in and around the lagoon, um, and as well as the effects of stormwater on our waterways. So I won't go too much into these. Um, we'll just want to touch on them a little bit. Um, another thing that we do is restoration, and we recently expanded our mangrove capacity. Um, and in the non-times of COVID, we have monthly workshops uh, where we have volunteers come in and help maintain our mangroves. And we have a lot of plantings going on, um, especially this year. Um, so if you're a homeowner with um, more than 100 or about 100 linear feet and you're interested in possibly restoring your shoreline, please contact the Marine Resources Council and see if we can help you out. And then the last thing that we do is education. Um, and which is what we're doing right here right now with our uh, live webinar um, and talking about our rain barrels. Um, just to make sure that we're you know, very familiar with the Indian River Lagoon, um, I just wanted to share some of my favorite facts about it. More than 30% of Florida's East Coast. And that is a zoom out of Florida's East Coast. And so you can see that it, the Indian River Lagoon system encompasses a huge area of Florida. And there we are with Brevard County. Um, and so we have the largest portion of the Indian River Lagoon system along our coastline. And the entire system is 156 miles long, which is almost 3,000 football fields in length, or basically going to Disney World and back. And because it's so huge, it supports more species than almost anywhere else on Earth, over 4,300 different species of plants and animals. And that's due to the fact that it was once a naturally resilient system with its vast mangrove forests and abundant seagrass beds. We have changed the lagoon. And the greatest thing that we have done to change the lagoon is to change our natural habitats um, into impervious surfaces. And you can really see that in the picture on the left-hand side, um, that we don't have a lot of natural green habitat as much. All those little white specks are uh, different houses and buildings and structures. And so we don't have those natural systems that are capturing uh, the storm water. And a lot of people don't realize what goes down the drain goes into our water systems, which lead into the lagoon. Um, and so how I meant, earlier I mentioned that the Marine Resources Council does a lot with water quality and monitoring. Um, and one of the things that we do is we also create the Indian River Lagoon report card, um, which is kind of like a health update that's kind of user friendly for the average person. Um, and it talks about over 20 years of state monitoring data, and it's evaluating the water quality and seagrass health 
um, of the Indian River Lagoon. So taking that actual data and then comparing it to regulatory standards. And so what we found through this is that in 2016, we had that massive super bloom, which resulted in very poor water quality scores throughout the northern portion of the lagoon. Each one of those little dots is a sampling location, which is extrapolated out into a full color of those different bodies of water. And you can see that the northern portion of the lagoon, the Mosquito Lagoon and the Banana River are all, were all doing quite poor. However, in 2017, and you can see that there was an improvement. Um, you can see that the, all the dots started turning from red to yellow, some lighter oranges, and even some green. So you can see that the water quality did improve over time. Uh, same with the southern portion of the lagoon. You can see that it moved from about average to about pretty decent. They're even some very good locations. Um, However, we do know that things are changing now in the lagoon. Um, so hopefully uh, our water quality scores will still be all right. Um, however, so our water quality was improving, but our seagrass um, was definitely still suffering. You can see that we didn't have a lot of great scores throughout the entire lagoon during 2016. In 2017, you can see that there wasn't very much improvement at all. You can also see that for the southern portion of the lagoon. Not a lot of change, maybe marginal amount, but still our seagrass has really had some issues recovering uh, in the lagoon. So the big question everyone always asks, is the health of the lagoon improving? Um, so when you're looking at this graph, you can see that the solid blue line is the all the different years, um, the averages um, throughout the year, um, from 1996 all the way to 2017, uh, what, that, what the levels were. Um, and that for the uh, green, that is the habitat quality for the seagrass. And so you can see that over time, you know, it's still it's very jagged, kind of difficult to see what's happening. Um, so the dotted lines, the blue dotted line is the water quality trend. And you can see that it's going kind of straight across, almost matching up to that stable level. Um, whereas the habitat quality trend, that seagrass, is kind of on like a downward trend. Um, so maybe the water quality is doing all right. Maybe seagrass is still struggling a little bit. Um, but with results like these, a lot of people ask, what can I do to help? How can I continue that stable water quality level? And how can I improve the seagrass habitat? One of the easiest things that you can do to help support the lagoon is to become lagoon loyal. Um, this is a new environmental education campaign uh, that's sponsored by Brevard County um, that's really going out to help raise awareness amongst community members about the positive impacts that they can do uh, to the lagoon um, by becoming, and uh, they can receive positive uh, coupon, or points, excuse me, points um, for coupons from different businesses that they can use in and around the lagoon. Um, so I highly recommend becoming Lagoon Loyal, and this presentation that you came to attend will also count towards uh, becoming Lagoon Loyal. The next thing you can do is to skip the fertilizer. Um, we are still in our fertilizer ban uh, for about two more weeks or so. Um, so when the fertilizer ban does re uh, is lifted, please um, maybe, you know, Ask yourself, does your lawn really need fertilizer? Um, can you use maybe an alternative fertilizer, perhaps one that still does not have uh, nitrogen in it or any phosphorus, maybe something that has iron in it that might help your plants in a different kind of way or magnesium. Um, also, please do not apply within 10 feet of water. Another thing that you can do that's super simple um, that will make a big impact on the lagoon is taking care of your grass clippings properly. Grass is full of excess nutrients that cause algae blooms. Grass is fantastic at pulling up the nitrogen and phosphorus and just being like little green monsters full of nutrients. Um, but when they are cut and they go down the storm drain, it's just like dropping off a bunch of like a fertilizer bomb into the lagoon. Uh, and there's different things that you can reuse, do with your uh, grass clippings, such as you can go back onto your yard and use them as lawn fertilizer. 
um, or you can even use them as mulch for garden beds. And you can use them as compost material. Like I said, they have a ton of nutrients. So if you just use it as composting or blow it back into your yard, you're reusing those nutrients. So say no to grass clippings. Um, if you do not uh, maintain your own lawn and you have somebody else maintaining it, uh, please make sure that you're using uh, responsible professionals that are diverting their mower chute away from permeable surfaces and storm drains. Um, make sure that they're blowing the grass clippings back onto the lawn and they're only applying fertilizers and pesticides when they're needed and not excessively. Um, also, please pick up after your pet. Uh, 102 tons of dog waste are left in the lagoon watershed every single day. And that's a that is more than the space shuttle. Uh, a lot of people think that, oh, it's fine because dog waste is natural. However, uh, one, if there's 102 tons of it. I don't think anybody wants that in the lagoon. Um, and then two, it contains harmful bacteria, or it can contain harmful bacteria and parasites. Um, and, it can, and those can enter the lagoon through our stormwater as well. So be a good human and pick up after your pet. Um, another thing you can do is plant Florida-friendly plants. Uh, these are going to be adapted for Florida's environment. So that means one, less maintenance, and two, it's going to have a, a less uh, excess water requirement because it's going to be adapted to Florida's rainfall. Um, and then it's going to be able to adapt to its harsh, the, or it's going to be able to survive the harsh sunlight and um, other environmental stressors that are specific to Florida. And they're going to attract native Florida plant uh, animals, such as hummingbirds and butterflies. You can also start your own mangrove nursery by collecting propagules that you find along the shoreline. Never pick them from trees. And then you can start your own little mangrove nursery. And we do have more information about how to start your own mango nursery on the Marine Resources Council website. So if you're interested in more information, please let me know. You can also make sure that you're washing the car right. Using a commercial car wash because they must properly dispose of wastewater. Um, or if you like to wash your car at home, that's totally fine. Just try to wash your car on the grass or the gravel if you have any. Um, please do not pour soap into storm drains. Whatever goes into your storm drain along your street has a potential to go into the lagoon. Um, and lastly, you can reduce your water use in general. Simply watering the grass less or watering during um, proper times, making sure that it's not going to rain uh, before you water. Um, and then also making sure that your sprinklers are not watering the sidewalk. Um, and, or you can use a spray nozzle, so you're using targeted watering. or use a rain barrel, which is the whole reason why we're here today. So now that you all have a solid background, um, we are going to talk more about our rain barrels. Uh, this is a picture off of uh, the lagoon house and I love it because it just shows the intensity of a lot of Florida storms that we have and the amount of rainfall uh, that we get here. Um, and so the rain in Brevard County, its average is 54 inches per year, whereas the U.S. average is only 38 inches per year. So we get a ton of rainfall. And to kind of put this more in perspective, because we don't have those natural habitats capturing a lot of those waters, we have our roads, now we have our houses, we have a lot of impermeable surfaces, a 40 foot by 80 foot roof will produce over 100,000 gallons of water per year. That same roof in the month of April, it only has an average of 2.1 inches of rain per year in the month of April. It will produce a runoff of over 4,000 gallons, which is equivalent to 76 55 gallon rain barrels. Before I moved to Florida, I didn't think that rain barrels actually worked. I thought there's, like, there's no way it's going to capture that much water. I have been absolutely amazed at the amount of water that the rain barrels at our lagoon house capture. So uh, these are uh, our rain barrels right here. Um, and so if you have already purchased a rain barrel, this is what you're going to get. Um, they are 55 gallon food grade barrels. So that means that we're reusing barrels. So we're, um, you know, reducing our impact, increasing sustainability. 
um, and we have cleaned them out and they've never had any like harsh chemicals in them. Um, so we've, we just cleaned them out pretty good um, and we cut the entire tops off of them. And the reason being is that gives you a little bit more flexibility about where you want to place it. A lot of people don't have access to uh, reciprocating saws um, because that's what you need to cut these heavy duty barrels. And so we cut the tops off for you so that um, you can place them in, around your home where it works best for you. Um, and then we cover them with mosquito netting. And this is going to prevent different insects from entering your water, um, kind of keep out any kind of like birds or anything. Um, and so that protects the water within the barrel. Um, and then we have secured the mosquito netting to the barrel with a recycled bicycle tire. Um, so we're in you know, again, we're reducing our impact and increasing sustainability by reusing different items. And we have a three quarter inch spigot attached, which fits most garden hoses. So it's a very diverse barrel. So when you are installing your rain barrel, um, you know, this is the first critical step is making sure that you are putting your barrel in a spot that you're going to have, where you're going to use it. Where is the rain barrel going to be best suited in your yard so that you actually use the rainwater and it doesn't just become some junk sitting in your yard? Um, the next step is to make sure that you're putting it near a downspout or a V in your roof. Um, some people have asked, you know, what if I don't have a V in my roof or a downspout? Kind of watch when it rains around your house where the rain goes. Maybe um, you're going to have like a point in your roof um, or, you know, you'll notice that the water kind of accumulates more towards one section of your yard. That might be a better spot to put your rain barrel. Um, and then additionally, you want to make sure that you put it out of direct sunlight. Um, you know, you try the best you can with it. We are in Florida, so we, you know, we can't really escape the sun here. Um, so we do get a little bit of sun on our barrels, um, and that's totally fine. You just, we recommend that you put a hand to the barrel before you use the water in it, um, just to make sure that the water's not super hot or baking in the sun because hot water and plants don't mix. So um, with our rain barrel system, we have them right by our mangroves, our mangrove nursery, you can kind of see them right there. Um, and then we have it near, right near our downspout system. And then you want to make sure, once you've picked your location, you want to make sure that you have it on a, your rain barrel on a solid level surface. And you know, you can be flexible or creative with that. Uh, you want to make sure that you, you can use like a gravel bed or paving tiles or bricks or a cement pad, anything that's going to keep your rain barrel nice and flat. Um, you don't want to have something like a half filled rain barrel, have a little kid come by and shake the rain barrel and the rain barrel falls over. Um, you just want to make sure that's nice and level. And so with our rain barrel system, we use paving tiles and cinder blocks. Um, so after you've selected your location, you've got a nice stable surface, um, you need to raise the elevation. Uh, and this is important to raise the elevation first before you adjust your downspout so you know how high um, or what you need to do to your downspout to make it more accessible to your rain barrel. Um, what we do at the Marine Resources Council is we use two levels of cinder blocks with paving tiles. And we put the paving, or we put four paving tiles down, and then we put our cinder blocks in a square spiral to kind of make sure that there's no weak parts. Um, you can also use pre-made stands from hardware retailers. Uh, those can range anywhere from 25 to a couple of hundred dollars, um, whereas using cinder blocks and paving tiles, maybe 25, 30, maybe at the most. Um, you can also use wooden stands. Uh, just make sure that you are building a very, very sturdy structure as these barrels can be over 460 pounds when they're full. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not, that you're using quality wood if you're building a wooden structure. Um, and the higher the barrel, the better the flow due to gravity. It's going to help that water flow come out. Um, then for installation, additionally, um, oops, I went through again. That was weird. Pardon me. There we go. Okay, awesome. So this is um, a picture of 
someone who installed the rain barrel. They had purchased one of our barrels um, and they kind of did like a hybrid of the two. Um, they used that cinder block and paving tiles uh, method, but then they used about half of a whiskey barrel um, that they filled with dirt and then they had some plants growing in it. So any kind of like overflow from the barrel watered the plants. Um, and so it's kind of like a fun, more aesthetic uh, looking way than just having your rain barrel fully exposed on cinder blocks. Cool. All right. So your next step, um, now that you've built your height, you need to decide if you're going to adjust your downspout. Um, and if so, do you need to have an overflow hose or diverter system? Um, and so I tie these two together because they really do kind of influence each other. Um, our method here at the Lagoon House was to have a flexible downspout added. Um, and we also have kind of like our overflow system is connecting our rain barrels uh, in a huge line of eight rain barrels all connected together. Um, so for if you are just going to adjust your downspout, you need to determine um, if you're going to straight cut, um, just kind of chop off your downspout, um, or and slash or if you're going to add a flexible downspout extension. You can get those for, I wanna say three to $15 um, at any kind of hardware store. Um, and to cut your uh, downspout, you can use a hacksaw or tin snips. Um, it is loud, uh, but it's super easy to do. Um, and then depending on which kind of downspout extension you use, you may need to secure it with metal screw, screws or zip ties if needed. Some da flexible downspouts will just stick on there really good and you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, so it's just going to depend on what materials you use. Um, and then next, as I mentioned, you're going to need to determine if you need an overflow hose or a diverter system. Um, and this is because the barrels do fill up incredibly quickly. Um, you know, a 10 by 10 foot roof will fill up uh, within an inch of rain, within an inch of rainfall. Um, so you're filling up an entire barrel really quickly. Um, and you want, and let's say you don't use your rainwater in between uh, one rain event and the next rain event, you need to make sure that you have a method for dealing with your excess rainfall from your barrel. Um, and what you can do with that is either have an overflow um, tube that will direct the water away from your home. You can either add additional rain barrels or you can always leave a soaker hose on your rain barrel. And the reason why you want to divert that overflow water away from your house is because you don't want that excess water kind of just billowing and overflowing right next to the foundation of your house. Okay. So here is an example of uh, using a downspout diverter system. So the water is obviously going down through the downspout and then there's a little like lip with inside of that diverter that attaches to the hose. So this kind of prevents uh, debris from going down in that tube and then into the barrel. And so once that barrel fills up, the water will then go back up that tube and down the downspout. Um, and then you can have your uh, downspout to go away. Let's see, I think I had a hand raise. Marta, do you have a question? Do you want to submit through our chat or through the Q&A? All right. Um, so, oh, let's see. Okay, no worries. All right. Um, so then over here, this is the diverter um, that you can use as well. So water goes into the rain barrel, um, fills up, and then once that rain barrel is full, it can go through that tube and away from your house. Um, so these are two different methods for using kind of like a diverter system. Um, and then here is a schematic where you can see the uh, one barrel system with the downspout, um, having that adjusted tube to it so that the water's going into the barrel. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you can see that there's a water uh, a system of barrels. So these are two different methods for dealing with excess water. 
Um, and then here is kind of like that li or live, uh, the picture, real life picture version um, of connecting multiple barrels. Um, and you can see that these pictures are using the barrel, they're connecting the barrels from the bottom, um, or you can connect the barrels at the top. It doesn't really matter too much. Uh, our only recommendation is making sure that you have a uh, larger opening. Um, on the right hand picture, we have about, a, I want to say it's like a three inch diameter PVC pipe. Um, and so that's, that helps one in case there's any debris in your barrels and you can't access um, those pipes and two so that water flows really well from one barrel to the next and you don't get like a backup of water and your system having your system fail um, so now that you've installed it you need to work on your maintenance rain barrels do have some upkeep that you have to take care of um, we do recommend that you drain your barrel monthly if you're not regularly using the water. Um, that's so that you don't get stagnant water or any kind of algae growing in it. Um, and then you'll also need to make sure that you're keeping your gutters clean. Uh, you don't need to do it all the time, um, but you know, after a big leaf change as, or big season change and we lose a lot of leaves, you might wanna just check your gutters to make sure that you're not getting a ton of leaf litter accumulating in them, which then in turn goes into your barrel. The cleaner you keep your gutters and your barrel, uh, the less chance that you'll get of debris going into uh, your spigot. Um, so that leads into our next one. Keep your barrels and spigots free of debris. Um, if you ever start losing flow from your spigot, um, you can use uh, a, like a little wire piece or even um, you can use uh, like a zip tie and stick it reverse through your spigot and kind of get out some of that debris. Um, if you do have any issues with algae growth, because it can happen, one, if you're not using your barrel regularly, two, um, if it is in a sunny spot, and three, just over you know long periods of time of using your rain barrel, you might get some algae growth. Um, so what you can do to combat that is to dump your barrel, rinse it, and then add a small cap full of bleach, and that'll help keep the algae level down. And the uh, it, just using a small amount of bleach will not harm your plants if you're using your water for taking care of your plants. Um, and then also kind of check for leaks, um, maybe every six months to about a year. Uh, you can use aquarium caulk or any kind of PVC cement. Um, you can find them at hardware stores uh, and they work great. Like I said, the barrels are pretty industrial, uh, so you shouldn't have any leaks, but we do recommend checking your spigot just in case. And then about once a year, please drain your barrel completely, rinse it, scrub it with soap and water or bleach, and then let it dry. This will help kill anything that's been on it that might have been growing that you don't want to have there. Um, a couple of things that you can do with your rain barrel water. Uh, you can use it for watering grass or flower gardens. You can use it for watering your house plants. You can fill up a little watering can and take it inside and take care of your house plants. Um, you can also use your rainwater for filling bird baths dog pools or uh, any kind of ponds that you have, um, as well as human pools. Um, so the thing with human pools is you wanna make sure that you're not abruptly changing your water chemistry. Um, so slowly add water from your rain barrel into your pool um, and then make sure that you're staying on top of your pool maintenance. Um, make sure that the pH of your pool is not changing greatly um, with the addition of the rain water. Um, so, if you fill it with rainwater, maybe give your pool 24 hours and then swim. You can also use your rainwater for washing your car. Just please make sure that you're washing your car either on grass or gravel to make sure that that soap or any kind of like grit from your car is not going down the drain and into the lagoon. Um, and then we have had a lot of questions about people wondering, can you use your rain barrel water for watering your vegetable gardens? Um, and you know, it is kind of like a mixed bag response to that. Um, there was a study done by Rutgers, which recommended that it is totally fine to use your uh, rain barrel water to water your vegetable or uh, herb gardens. Um, they just recommend using about a 3% leach solution, um, which is equivalent to about one ounce per our 55 gallon rain barrels. Um, additionally, they do not recommend using the water from your rain barrel if your roof has been treated with any kind of like mold or um, any kind of like, or excuse me, uh, 
mold repellent um, or any other kind of like pesticide treatment or mold treatment um, because you don't want that going into your water and then using that on your plants. Um, and then also don't use it if you have a copper roof. Um, and then if you are going to use the water, please make sure that you're applying it to the soil of the vegetable gardens, not the actual plants. And you can do this really easy with just having a soaker hose attached from your rain barrel and then into uh, your vegetable garden. Um, and then make sure that you're watering them in the morning. So turn your spigot on in the morning um, and that will give the time for UV radiation to kind of sterilize anything um, if there's anything in the rain barrel water. Um, so if you have already uh, purchased your rain barrel online, um, we have pre-purchase only available for pickup at the Public Works office at 1600 Minuteman Causeway. Uh, and you can pick it up Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we ask you to please call this number so that there will be someone to assist you. Um, and if you have not purchased a rain barrel and are interested in purchasing one, um, or you have indicated that you would like to pick up your rain barrel at the Lagoon House, uh, which is located off of Dixie Highway in Palm Bay, we are, we are still closed to the public, but we are staffed Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we always have additional rain barrels uh, available for purchase through our online gift shop. And rain barrels are kind of like potato chips. You can't just have one. The Lagoon unites us all, thank you. And if you have signed up for Lagoon Loyal, this is your opportunity now to scan this QR code by opening the camera app on your smartphone and scanning it, and that will help you accrue points. Um, so you need to log into your Lagoon Loyal account and then scan it. Um, and then if you have any questions, now is a great time. And thank you so much. I'll leave that up um, in case anybody needs to uh, scan it and then feel free to ask questions. All right. All right, Kelsey, are you still alive there? Yes, I'm still here. Can you can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, we can hear you now. Um, do we have any questions in the q and I haven't seen any questions. No, not yet. Okay. Yeah, like Nicole said, um, we do have some rain barrels available at the City of Cocoa Beach Public Works. Um, you can pick them up there. Um, you do have to pre-purchase them through MRC, but we can definitely assist you um, and answer any questions that you might have about installation of those at your house. Um, we have a question that popped up in the Q&A. All right, and so our Lagoon House address, um, I will pull it up right here. That way everybody can see it. There we go. Okay, so uh, we have another question submitted. Uh, did you say the study recommended to use a 3% bleach solution for watering vegetables? Why is that? Um, yes, a 3% bleach solution, so about one ounce of bleach um, to a 55 gallon rain barrel. Um, that's what they recommended in the study. And the reason being, just in case if there's any kind of um, bacteria possibly that was picked up in the rainwater um, or any kind of like uh, possible like fungus treatments, you want to make sure that that's not getting into uh, your vegetables. Um, so. We can't say like 100% like absolutely water your vegetables, you know, it is going to be your call um, if you are comfortable using your rainwater to water your vegetables. Otherwise, rainwater is great for pools and for um, uh, pools and uh, watering your grass and houseplants and things like that. Okay. Uh, yes, you can still sign up for Lagoon Loyal, and I will be sending out a follow-up email with the recorded presentation, um, as well as the QR code again, and the QR code is active for seven days, um, but then after that time period, it will be deactivated, and you can no longer accrue these points. Um, if you're interested in more mangrove help, um, please visit us. I'll put it in the chat real quick. Please go to um, savetheirl.org. 
Um, this is the Marine Resources Council website. And if you go to restoration, um, you will be able to find information about mangroves, or you can give us a call during normal working, business working hours at 321-725-7775. And we're happy to assist you with any kind of mangrove needs. Um, or you can even email our director of restoration at kitty at mrcirl.org. All right, let's go. Oh, we got some QA questions. All right, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate all the kind words. Um, it definitely makes this job uh, rewarding when we have positive feedback um, and we're always looking to improve. So we greatly appreciate um, all the nice compliments from everyone. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, yeah, thank you all. Um, and if there are no other questions, Oh, we got one more. Yes, we did record. Uh, the Zoom presentation is currently being recorded um, and we will be uploading it to YouTube um, within the next couple of days. And once that is done, I will share it through um, a follow-up email. So the same email that you received kind of reminding you to click onto our Zoom links, uh, you will also receive a follow-up email that'll say thank you and in case you missed it, um, and that will have the link. And then it will also be on the uh, savetheirl.org website, um, hopefully this week, probably early next week, just in case. Um, yes, so we do have a copy. Ooh, it's something I forgot to mention. Um, yes, you can get a copy of the Indian River Lagoon Health Report Card Study online at our website, www.savetheirl.org, or you can Google Marine Resources Council, um, and then it will be under a couple of different locations, either under science or under education. Um, and then we you saw that we only had data up until 2017. However, we now have the new data um, going all the way up until 2019. Um, and we will be, and we'll also include the tributaries that lead into the lagoon. And we will actually be presenting that information um, on September 26th for our National Estuaries Day celebration. And you can find more information about that again online um, at Save the IRL. Dot org. All right, Rose, do you have a question? All right. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate it. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nicole, for sharing uh, your virtual rain barrel workshop with us. We are very excited to bring this to our residents, and I'm excited to see uh, more presentations that you guys might bring in the future. Thank you. Yeah. And um, if um, anybody's interested, there was one last question that asked about um, if we give uh, volunteer presentation or presentations to volunteer groups. Uh, yes, that would be me. Um, and you can email me at uh, Nicole at mrcirl.org. Um, and we're more than happy to do presentations, uh, definitely virtually um, or in person if needed. Um, but right now we're offering a lot of virtual presentations through Zoom. All right, I think that was the last question. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelsey. I really appreciate uh, all your help throughout this presentation. And I hope the closed captioning weren't too insane. <laughs> all right. All right. So I'm going to end the meeting.